This is Easter weekend. I was doing my shopping at a supermarket and the lady on the checkout desk had a cross around her neck. And I said, hello. I said, you're a Christian. She says, what? I said, you're a Christian. She says, what are you talking about? I said, you've got a cross around your neck. She goes, oh, it's nice. I looked at her name, Tracy. I said, Tracy, it wasn't nice. It was nasty. And she looked at me as though I was an alien that had just landed from another planet. And so I'm putting all the shopping on the conveyor belt, and we're talking. I said, listen, Tracy, if I had an earring here, and you said, what's your earring? Oh, that one there? That's a gas chamber. No, yeah, a gas chamber earring. And you said, why are you wearing a gas chamber earring? And I said, well, I want to remember how millions of Jewish people died in the Second World War. Then you said to me, what's your other earring? That's an electric chair. No, yeah, electric chair. And you said, why are you wearing an electric chair earring? And I said, well, I want to remember how certain criminals in the United States got executed for their crimes. I said, what would you think of me, Tracy, if I was walking around with an electric chair earring and a gas chamber earring? She says, well, I, I think there's something wrong with your head. So I said, Tracy, is that because they're symbols of execution? She goes, that's right. That's right. I said, so Tracy, what are you wearing around your neck? And there was a moment in the entire superstore when it felt like everyone went quiet. I said, you've got to remember this. You've got to remember this, Tracy. Jesus didn't wear it around his neck. He wore it on his back. Big difference. Listen, if you wear a cross around your neck as jewellery, take it off. Because that's probably blasphemous. You wear it because you know what it means. You can never wear the cross as jewellery. You wear it because you have committed yourself to it. That's why you wear it. One of my favorite stories is of a famous artist who went back to the very small rural community where he was born and grew up. And he's walking around the, the, the stores and he sees an antique store. And in, in the window of the antique store was one of his masterpieces. He couldn't believe it. It was a painting that he'd painted years before he was famous. The frame was broken. The picture was scratched and dirty, but it was his. But he couldn't go into the antique shop and say, hey, that's my painting. Give it back to me. If he wanted it back, he had to buy it back before he could clean it, before he could restore it, before he could reframe it. That's what Jesus did on Good Friday. Jesus bought us back because we needed cleaning, we needed restoring, and we needed reframing. He died on the cross. They took him down from the cross. They stuck a spear in his side. Out came blood and water. Might be a minor detail. No, it's not actually, because by, by blood and water, it means that he was dead and the blood had separated. They wrapped him in a linen cloth. A man called Joseph of Arimathea said, hey, listen, I, I'd like to take Jesus and I'd like to put him in the tomb that I've got. So they put him in a tomb. The Jewish authorities went to the Roman authorities and they said to Pilate, this Jesus said that he's going to rise from the dead. I mean, what kind of a nonsense is that? But you know what people are like. They like to kind of gossip. So let's prevent any kind of gossip going around that he might rise from the dead. Can you send a guard to guard the tomb? And Pilate was annoyed, but he said, 
I'll send a guard. So a whole group of guards go to guard the tomb, and they put a seal on the tomb. Okay, where the stone fitted into the tomb, there's a crack. A Roman seal was an injection of wax into the crack with a Roman insignia on the wax. If anyone broke the wax, the Roman seal, without Roman approval, you would be executed. So you're not really going to go and break the wax. Do you know what I mean? Oh, it is a Roman seal. Let's break it. No, no, no. Right? You see, I, I just want you to get the details here so you can understand what happened at God's funeral. Okay? Now, the, the disciples of Jesus and some of the women... Mary, the mother of Jesus, another woman called Mary, another woman called Joanna. They're all up in this room called the upper room. And the conversation in the upper room is not very encouraging. It's pretty depressing. They're all going, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? He's dead. He's dead. What are we going to do? It's over. Now, do you know, I think if I hung around with Jesus for three years... And he said to me, listen, I'm going to die. It's going to be a Friday. But don't worry about it, J. John. I'll be back Sunday. So chill out about it. <laughs> I think I would have believed him. If I hung out with him for three years. Now, you see, this is actually interesting. You see, the disciples of Jesus didn't believe. They were always like so shattered by these events. They, they, even though he told them and told them, they were like, oh, God, no, no, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Okay, Sunday morning. Okay, Mary decides with the women, hey, let's go down to the tomb. And what we're going to do, we'll put some spices and ointment. That was a very Jewish thing to do. It's a bit like us visiting uh, a cemetery on a special occasion to put some flowers in remembrance or whatever. It's like that. So goes down to the tomb very, very early. It's very misty. Now, it never occurs to her. How is she going to get past the guard? How on earth is she going to move the stone? There's no way she could move the stone. But those sorts of details just don't occur to her. She arrives there at the tomb. There's no guards. There's no stone. And she's kneeling on the floor, not knowing what to do. And then she hears somebody. She turns around and she kind of thinks he must be the gardener, the gardener who looks after the tombs. And, and she says, where have you put him? Where have you put him? And he says, Mary. And the next thing you read is, please let go, Mary. Okay, let's reenact that. Where have you put him? Where have you put him? Where have you put him? Mary. Mary. Only one person ever says it quite like that. Jesus. She got up. She ran to Jesus. She grabbed hold of him. Jesus, you're alive. Jesus, you're alive. Please let go, Mary. <laughs> I've got a busy day today. Go back, go back to the disciples and tell the disciples I'm alive. So she goes back up the steps, up the, knocks on the upper room door. The disciples, oh no, who is it? It's so early in the morning. It must be the Romans. Oh no, what are we going to do? Well, we can't jump out the window. We're at the top, aren't we? You know, there's only one door. They open the door. It's Mary. Mary says, I've seen him. See who? I've seen Jesus. Jesus who? I've seen the Lord. I saw the Lord. Do you know what they said? S sit down. Shut up. You're talking a load of nonsense. I mean, that's pretty rude, really, isn't it? That's not what you say. You're talking a load of nonsense. Two disciples, not of the original 12, two others, they, they can't take it anymore. They say, hey, guys, that's it. We're going back to where we, we, we were before we found Jesus. Yeah, we're, we've had enough. 
So to get there, they have to walk on this road called the Emmaus Road. And as they're walking along the Emmaus Road, really discouraged and depressed, they bump into a man. The man says to him, hey guys, why are you looking so depressed and discouraged? They said, have you not heard? He goes, heard what? You've not heard about Jesus? He goes, well, Jesus, what happened? Were you not there on Friday? He says, well, tell me. So they told him. And then the man begins to explain to them, using the Old Testament, he begins in Genesis, he takes them all the way through to Malachi, and he tells them about the Messianic prophecies, about the arrival of the King of Heaven on earth, what he would do, how he would do it, the fact that he would die, and the fact that he would rise from the dead. Do you know there are 322 Messianic prophecies? Okay, this is, this is like a seven-mile walk to get there. They get to the end, and the man is about to say, okay, I'm going that way. They go, no, we live just here. Look, come and eat with us. So he says, okay, they get the food ready. It's a custom in a Jewish home. If you have a visitor, you ask your visitor to say grace. I don't know what it was, but they said to him, would you break the bread? And at that moment, maybe as he, he held his hands and the sleeves of his robe fell back, maybe they saw the holes in his hands. But the moment he broke the bread, the scales from their eyes fell off. Jesus! Uh, Jesus! He vanished. I can't... We've been walking with Jesus. Didn't our hearts, they burnt within us. They left their supper out the door. They ran seven miles up the upper room door, knocked on the door. Everyone inside. Oh, no. Oh, goodness me. Who is it now? They open the door. These two walk in and they say, we've seen Jesus. And the disciples said, he's dead. He's dead. Mary gets up and says, I told you. I told you. Right? Just get the feel of this scenario here. The two are saying, we saw him. Our hearts burnt within us. Mary says, that's what happened to me. Everyone else says, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead. And then he walks in. <laughs> that's pretty good, isn't it? I was, I was debating with a professor at Cambridge University and he was really arrogant. And it is kind of doing my head in a bit. And then uh, as we're kind of debating, I, and he was talking, I said, oh, Lord, could you just turn up now? I just want to see if he wets himself. <laughs> so I'm having this conversation with the Lord. I know it might disrupt your second coming plans, but I just want to, you know, a lot of people are going to wet themselves. When he turns up. But you know what was amazing? Jesus walks in. He walks in. And this is what he says. Peace be with you. If it was me, I would have said, you gits. <laughs> Do you know that word here, git? Yeah. Yeah. You idiots. I mean, what's wrong with you? I can't believe you hung out with me for three years. You're all a banana short of a fruit bowl. <laughs> you know, all of you are a Spanish short of a toolkit. You know, does the elevator not work? Well, it obviously doesn't go to the top, does it? <laughs> if it was me, that's what I would have done. But he goes, peace be with you. He speaks the peace, peace. He goes, and they, and it says in the Gospels, they couldn't believe, they couldn't believe, they couldn't believe, they thought it was a ghost. He goes, I'm not a ghost. I'm not a ghost. Look, touch me, feel me. He goes, what are you eating? They go, fish. He goes, I'll have some. Can you imagine? Give him some. You give him some. Give him some. And then he goes, here's a little bit of fish, Jesus. And it says this in the Bible. He took the fish, he put it in his mouth, he crunched it. The moment he crunched it, they all became Christians. 
I mean, can you imagine interviewing them here today? So, how did you become a Christian? Well, I saw Jesus eat some cod. <laughs> and, uh, and how did you become a Christian? Yeah, I saw him eat a bit of sea bass. Really? Was that the tipping point? Yeah, it was the tipping point. And do you know what the Bible says? The Bible says they still could not believe because they were so full of joy. I mean, what an interesting little expression. You know, two guys, right? They're having a chat. And, uh, and one guy goes, uh, you know Ruth? Yeah, Ruth. I really like Ruth. So like her, I tell you. I keep thinking about her all the time. He goes, do you? Yeah, yeah. Really like her. Anyway, the next day, the guy says to him, you know the Ruth we were talking about yesterday? Yeah, yeah. Well, I found out from her friend, she likes you. No, no, no. You know, you're so full of joy, you don't believe it. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just trying to help you understand the passage. You know, you're so happy. You don't believe it. Anyway, so Jesus says, like, Jesus says to the guys, listen, guys, hang out here because you're all useless. And, um, okay, wait, wait. And then, and then don't worry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back. I'll give you my Holy Spirit. And then you can start being useful. Okay? So he says, look, I've got to go off and do a few little errands. So Jesus leaves. And they're like, oh, why didn't we believe? Why didn't we believe? Why didn't we believe? Knock on the door. Open the door. It's Thomas. Thomas, one of the disciples, he'd gone off. He got fed up. He'd gone round the block. He missed all this. He's there at the door. They said, Thomas, you ain't going to believe this. What? We all just saw Jesus. We've all just all had fish and chips with him. (laughs) He was not happy. He was not, this is what Thomas said, I will not believe, I will not believe unless I put my finger in the hole is in, in his hand and I put my hand in the hole in his side, I won't believe. I mean, what a stupid thing to say. You know, you, you, you go and visit your uncle who's just had a heart operation and your uncle says, yeah, I've just had this heart bypass and, and this and this. And then you go, no, nah, don't believe it, uncle. Don't believe it. Unless I put my finger in the artery, I ain't going to believe you. I mean, what kind of nonsense is that? So, you know, I'm going to put my finger in there. I mean, it's like some of them are just like, they're not quite there, are they? Do you know, I love it. Jesus left them up there for a whole week. He must have a great sense of humor, Jesus. Because every day, you can imagine Mary walking around going, Peter, he's alive. Oh, my word. Andrew, he's alive. Philip, he's alive. Wow, he's alive. He's alive. Hello, Thomas. I mean, it's funny, isn't it? And he leaves, and I can imagine Thomas every day going, where is he? Where is he? Where is he? Anyway, seventh day, Jesus walks in. (laughs) And Jesus says, hey, Tom, come over here, Tommy. Put your finger here. Put your finger here. Put your hand here. Isn't that what you said? Isn't that what you said? Come on, then. And then Thomas says, and I think you can only say this, if you're kneeling down. And I reckon he must have knelt down and he said, he did say, my Lord and my God. And Jesus says, Thomas, do you believe? Do you believe because you see me? Blessed are those who believe who haven't seen me. So he's talking about us, us. He's saying that if we believe, having not seen him, we will be more blessed than the original disciples. More blessed. In the 18th century in London, there were two men, a man called Gilbert West and a man called Lord Littleton. And they were really annoyed that a lot of their friends were becoming Christians. 
Gilbert West said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write a book to slander Christianity, to disprove Christianity. The only way you can disprove Christianity is to disprove the resurrection. So he says, I'm going to write a book to disprove the resurrection. He begins writing his book. Halfway through writing his book, he meets Jesus. And so he wrote his book the other way round. I've got one of the original copies from the 18th century. And his book, I mean, it's just unbelievable. And so the entire book, and the title of the book is Observations on the History and Evidences of the Resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the 19th century, a very famous atheist in America called Engersoll, he didn't like it that many people were becoming Christians. He had a very good friend called Lou Wallace, who was a general, very famous. He says to his friend Lou, Lou, we've got to slander Christianity. We've got to kind of, you know, uh, write against it. How about you writing a book against Jesus and against Christianity? So Lou Wallace, he begins to write his book. Halfway through writing his book, Lou Wallace meets Jesus. And so he threw his manuscripts away, and then he wrote his book the other way around, and his book is called Ben-Hur. Wow. In the 20th century, there was a lawyer and a journalist called Frank Morrison, and he decided that he would r attack Christianity. He would attack the resurrection. Now, he's a journalist, very, very good at research, very good at gathering material. He's also a lawyer. He knows how to play around with the material <laughs> to support his case. Halfway through, halfway through writing his book, he met Jesus. So he had to write his book the other way around, and his book is called Who Moved the Stone? So you want to become a Christian? Go and try and disprove the resurrection. Because Jesus is alive today, it authenticates everything that he said and everything that he did. After the resurrection, Jesus spent 40 days teaching. During that 40 days of teaching, he neither added nor withdrew what he had taught the previous three days. That's the reason we can believe in what Jesus said. People will often say to me when I travel around the world and go to universities and places, oh, what about other philosophies, other religions? What about them? Look, if you're walking down a street, you get to the end of the street, it branches into two. You don't know which way to go. Left, right, I don't know. There are two men lying there. One's dead, one's alive. Which one would you ask for directions? Wow. You see, I'm a Christian because I'm talking to the founder of Christianity who is still alive today. Today. Because Jesus Christ is alive today, we can be assured that we can have forgiveness from the past. And all of us, listen, all of us need that. We all have regrets in life. We all have disappointments. We look back in our lives and say, yeah, I've thought things I shouldn't have. I've seen things I wish I hadn't. And they kind of, they're still there in my radar. There are things I've said I ugh, wish I hadn't said them. There are things I've done I wish I hadn't done those things. And, and, and they accumulate, and they work a bit like an overdraft in a bank account. If you have an overdraft, I have one. You can't help me. I can't help you. The only one who can help us is someone in credit. Jesus was the only one in credit. If our greatest need was information, then God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need was money, then God would have sent us an economist. 
If our greatest need was technology, then God would have sent us a scientist. But our greatest need was forgiveness. That's why God sent us a savior. You see, because Jesus is alive, we know this is true. You and I today can be, re- we can receive forgiveness. And in a few minutes, you can get up and come here and say, yes. But not only forgiveness from the past, we can have new life today. Today. It's not just about pie in the sky when we die. It's steak on a plate while we wait. It's now. It's now. You know, I, I was a student in London, agnostic. And I met a Christian, and he introduced me to Christianity. And then after about six months, he showed me in the last book of the Bible, in chapter 3 of Revelation, verse 20, and it says this. Jesus stands outside of a door of a house, knocking. If you hear the knock, open the door, let Jesus in. And my friend Andy read this to me, and he said, have you heard Jesus knocking? I said, I think so. He says, have you opened the door? I said, where's the door? Where's the door? Where's the door? He said, don't worry about where the door is. Just ask Jesus to break the door down. On the 9th of February, 1975, I said, Jesus, if it's you that's knocking, could you break the door down? And as I said that prayer, it's like my heart was like warmed, really warmed, like, God, ah, like that. And my mind was illuminated. I didn't know what was happening, but it was good. (laughs) It was good. And I started to feel clean. Whoa, clear, real clean. My mother said to me, you're brainwashed. I said, mum, my brain has been washed. (laughs) If you only knew, mum, what was in my brain, you'd be pleased it got washed. (laughs) And I let him in. I let him in. You see, now, some of us, you know, we might get a door on our, uh, someone knocks on the door and we open the door and it's some salesperson. So we open the door a little bit like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what do you want? <laughs> what are you selling? And some people do that with Jesus. They kind of open the door and they go, yeah, yeah, so? And then others of us feel, oh, it's Jesus. Oh, yeah, come in, come in, come in. And he's in the hall. Yeah, so um, what do you want to do in my life? Oh, you want to do that and this and that and that. Mm. And then we open this kind of cupboard. Get in there. true, isn't it? Yeah, because some of us, we want Jesus, but whoa, don't want him interfering, do we? Yeah, what? You want to go and look in my desk? What? You want to check what? Uh, uh? Listen, if you want to experience the new life, you've got to bring him in. You've got to take him to the basement to clear out the cobwebs. You've got to take him to the attic to clear out the bats. You've got to open the sitting room, the dining room, the kitchen, every room. And when you do that, your life fills with his presence and, and his power and his peace. And his, the power of his spirit produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. New life, new life. Your whole life is filled with these things. Forgiveness from the past, new life today, and a hope for the future. In a world of hopelessness, we can have hope Hope. Why? Because Jesus has conquered death. And so if I'm in Jesus, I know I will conquer death in Jesus. And there is hope for me for the future. Do you want to follow Jesus? Do you? Did you used to follow Jesus, but you've got distracted, diverted, but you'd like to come back? 
listen, if you do, do it in a couple of minutes. When I ask you to come and stand here at the front, as I've reflected and read and understood Christianity, it seems to me that there are a number of kind of like um, stepping stones in, in this experience of following Jesus. The step one is admit. It's an admission. It's actually saying, yeah, yes, I admit. I admit. I bow in my heart or I bow with my knees. Jesus, you are my Lord and my God. It's an admission that he has died, that he has conquered death. It's also an admission that, yes, I have got an overdraft of regret, of disappointment, or as the Bible calls it, sin and trespass. I have, and I need cleansing. It's an admission. Now, some people will get to that point and go, yeah, you're right, J. John, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, pretty convincing, actually, yeah. And then that's it. Well, if you're only there, phew, you ain't going to get much because you've got to move from admit to commit. You've got to move to a commitment. It, it's like a guy and a, and, and a woman and, and, and the, the guy says, oh, yeah, I admit she's the one for me. She is the one, no, the one I've been waiting for. And then somebody says to him, so uh, are you going to commit? Ooh. Ooh. Ooh, that's another question, isn't it? Well, it isn't really, you idiot, you know. Is it? You've got to move from admit to commit, commit, commitment, commitment. You know, when two people get married, the minister says, will you take this woman to be your lawful wedded wife? He goes, well, I've been thinking, actually. <laughs> that wasn't the question, was it? Will you commit yourself to take this woman? He goes, I get excited, I get very excited. Well, that wasn't it. He didn't ask him if he gets excited. He says, will you, will you? You see, some of you, you've experienced something in this service today. You felt it. Yeah, but you might admit it, but nothing's really going to happen. Unless you commit, you commit, you commit yourself. Now, admit is step one. Commit is step two. But then you can't stay there. You've got to move to step three. Submit. Submit means reign and rule over all of my life, reign and rule over my time, my talents, my treasure. I open all the doors of my house. I ask you to come and just permeate every room, every area. I'm not going to have anything in my life that's locked away from you, God. That's called submission. When you do that, I tell you, your life, whew, it kind of explodes. It explodes. Now, step one, you make an admission. Step two, you make a commitment. Step three, you make a submission. But then you've got to move into step four, transmission. Transmit. Because if you've encountered the crucified, resurrected Jesus, then you become a, a carrier of the presence of God. You become an advertisement for Jesus. You become an ambassador for Jesus. And I know people, I've met people who've admitted, they've committed, they've even submitted, but they won't transmit it to anybody. But if you want real fulfillment and purpose and breakthrough, you've got to say, hey, I'm moving from admitting to committing to submitting to transmitting. That's what I'm going to do. And if you don't move through those four processes, you're going to remain a caterpillar. And Jesus wants you to be a butterfly. 